The Accidental Prime Minister by Tom McLaughlin. The Vote Joe Manifesto. Are you fed up of living in a country led by greedy, bumbling warthogs? otherwise known as grown-ups. Then look no further than Joe Perkins. Joe spoke up for a society in need of change. His views went viral and today you can reap the benefits of his youthful wisdom by voting. Yes to cats in hats. Yes to banana-shaped buses. Yes to fancy dress Fridays, but on a Thursday. Yes to Joe Perkins for Prime Minister. Where there is grumpiness, may we bring giggles. Where there is jelly, may we bring ice cream. Where there are chairs, may we bring whoopee cushions. Chapter 1. I don't like Mondays. Bleep! There are many awful sounds in this world. Fingernails down the blackboard, mum singing the theme tune to match the day in the shower, bagpipes being played badly, in fact, bagpipes being played brilliantly as well. But there are none worse than the sound of an alarm clock early on a Monday. Why are the mornings so early? Joe muttered to himself before trying to grab his alarm clock, missing it and falling out of bed. This was not uncommon for Joe. He often fell, even when no falling was required. He was one of life's great fallers. He fell into rooms, he fell out of them again. He even managed the almost impossible task of falling upstairs, which, let me tell you, is no mean feat. Joe's life was a constant battle with gravity, one in which gravity clearly had the upper hand. He picked himself up from the bedroom floor and set about trying to get dressed without opening his eyes. It was a trick that he tried to help fool his sleepy head that he was still in bed. The downside was it made putting pants on very tricky indeed. Up to that point, putting on underwear with his eyes shut was as close to living on the edge as Joe's life got. Joe lived in a tiny house in London with his mum. Dad had disappeared before Joe was born and he didn't have any brothers or sisters. The nearest he ever came to having a sibling was the time when a cat from down the street came to stay for 10 days last year. Other than Mr Tiddles, it had only ever been the two of them. Joe's mum was a park warden and that meant she spent most of her days making sure that the flowers were looked after and no dogs were doing their doings where they shouldn't. It was a job she loved and Joe loved her working there too. Joe's house didn't have a garden, just a tiny yard, the sort of place where you'd graze your knee if you fell over, which, as you know, is something Joe did a lot. So the park always felt like this and mum's garden. When mum wasn't in the park, pruning flowers and shouting at dog owners, she was in the kitchen cooking. It was her thing. She would stop off at the shops and buy the bags of food that no one else wanted, which she used for inspiration in the kitchen, thinking up extraordinarily weird recipes with which to torture, uh, I mean impress, Joe. Joe knew that it was really because money was sometimes tight, but it meant that mealtimes were never dull. I mean, who can forget the cheese salad with onion gravy or the plum tandoori crumble? Apart from the odd, odd meal, Joe's life was pretty and remarkable. Apart from, bring! Just then, the doorbell rang. Let me in! It's, it's an emergency! Came the exasperated cry from the other side. Joe's mum opened the door and there stood AJ, Joe's oldest and best friend. What is it, AJ? Joe's mum said, sounding panic-stricken. I smell your world-famous fresh tea and toast with sour rhubarb jam, Mrs P, and and, and I need a fix. AJ grinned and waggled an eyebrow up and down. AJ was the only person in the world who found Joe's mum's cooking not only edible, but enjoyable too. Then again, AJ did once eat a fingerful of his own earwax and geography for a bet, so it's fair to say he probably doesn't have the most sophisticated palate. Oh, AJ, doesn't your mother feed you? Joe's mum asked, rolling her eyes. But she was well used to AJ's TARDIS-like stomach. Breakfast is the most important meal of the day, Mrs P. That's why I make it my business to have as many as possible. Got any pork pies? AJ grinned, pushing past her in the direction of the breakfast table. You know I hate those things, AJ, mum said, shaking her head. I think it's the jelly. It makes me squeamish. 
AJ and Joe have been friends since they were at nursery when they found out they had the same birthday. And let me tell you, when you're three, that sort of thing blows your mind, which pretty much means you're destined to be bestest friends for life. If it wasn't for AJ, school would be nothing more than a yawn factory. AJ was the sort of boy who made even the dullest, dreariest things in life seem a giggle. He was always scheming, always thinking of a plan to make the teacher laugh, or trying to figure out how they were both going to become millionaires by next Tuesday. These plans failed nearly... Oh no, these plans nearly always involved Joe and nearly always failed, but that was half the fun. AJ was about to tuck into tea and toast dripping in sour rhubarb jam when there was a loud clatter from the letterbox as an important brown envelope landed on the mat. Bit early for the post, isn't it? Mum said. Ooh, it says special delivery. She opened it and unfolded the letter. Joe knew instantly that something was wrong. He could see it on Mum's face. What is it, Mum? Joe asked. Yeah, Mrs P, what's happened? AJ asked too. It's, it's, it's the park. They've, they've shut it down. For a second, no one said a word. Joe and AJ looked at each other, then back at Joe's mum. Her face was pale, her jaw dropped open. She stared at the letter, her eyes watery and ready to spill over with tears. Shut the park, Joe said furiously. They can't do that. It, it's, it's the park. Yeah, everyone loves that place, AJ joined in. Um, y- you boys best get to school. Or you'll, you'll be late, said Mum, her voice all shaky. But what about... Joe started to say. You leave that to me. I don't want you worrying. Mum tried to smile, but it didn't reach her eyes. If she was trying to reassure Joe, it wasn't working. He knew his mum needed that job. How else was she post- supposed to put sweet and sour spaghetti on the table? Don't worry, mum. I'll, I'll think of something. Joe's mum just nodded, turning away to wipe her eyes. Joe and AJ grabbed their bags and reluctantly headed out of the door. Neither of them said anything for what seems like ages. You're right, man, AJ asked, breaking the silence. I don't know. I can't believe they've closed the park. I mean, why? Joe said in disbelief. Don't know, AJ shrugged. But I know a man who might, he said, pointing down the road. As they turned the corner at the top of Joe's street, they saw a man in the distance. He had a ladder and a toolbox and was busy hammering a sign into the park gates. This made Joe's blood boil. If mum had been there, she would have given him what for. No one hammers anything into anything without her say-so first. Oi! AJ yelled. What are you doing? Joe read the sign. Under development. What's going on? Joe asked. Why have you closed the park? The man stopped what he was doing and shrugged. They don't tell me anything. I'm just the bloke who hammers things. Joe read the rest of the sign. Under development, this notice hereby declares that George's, St George's Park is closed with immediate effect and that from the 1st of July, this park will be redeveloped and a new block of luxury flats will be built. Department of Progress. Underneath the notice was a drawing of a posh building, tall and made of glass. It had pictures of smiling people chatting and drinking coffee outside. Joe and AJ looked through the park gates and could already see diggers moving in, ready to tear the plague around apart. This can't be happening, Joe muttered, blinking back the tears. This was the place where he and AJ hung out, where they used to plot how they were going to become mega rich and plan what to do if the world got taken over by zombies. This was the place where Joe and AJ used to play football, or rather, where AJ would kick the ball and Joe would try to get it out of the way before it hit him in the face. And now it was going to be turned into flats. Why wasn't anyone stopping this? Hello, hello, anything I can do? Joe turned to see a policeman standing by the sign and looking down at Joe and AJ. Yes, Joe gasped. Stop this man from closing the park. Yes, officer, AJ joined in. Arrest this man. Eh? said the man hammering. What did I do? You're closing the park, AJ yelled at him. I told you, I'm just the bloke who does the hammering. I'm not closing anything. Just then, a group of police motorcycle outriders whizzed past, sirens screaming and lights flashing as they went. It was like something from a movie, only it was happening in their street. What on earth? 
The man on the ladder said nearly, but rather disappointingly not falling off. Ooh, said AJ, glaring wide-eyed at the convoy of flashing blue lights and sirens. Do you think there's been a bank robbery? Or maybe aliens have landed? (gasps) Oh, I hope it's an alien invasion, said Joe. We'd definitely get the day off school for that. It's the Prime Minister, said the policeman. He's visiting here today and I'm here as backup. You mean you're not going to stop them closing the park, Joe said. Oh no, looks like the park's had it, he said, peering at the sign. Shame, I used to play here as a kid. Where's the Prime Minister visiting, Joe asked. A school, I think. Yeah, it's definitely a school. There was only one school down the end of the road, Joe and AJ's school. AJ and Joe looked at each other and without saying a word, they grabbed their bags and ran. Well, AJ ran. Joe tripped over his laces. I bet he can save the park, Joe yelled, picking himself up. Bound to, AJ grinned. At the very least, we'll probably get out of double algebra. This is even better than the time the dog came in the playground and pooed on the netball court, yelled Joe. Well, I don't know. That was a pretty special day, said AJ seriously. But it's definitely up there. By the time AJ and Joe got to school, there was a huge crowd already there of excited school children, policemen, TV reporters and cross-looking members of the public. There at the front of the crowd stood the headmaster, Mr Brooks. AJ nudged Joe. Mr Brooks looks, well, really weird. Has he combed his hair differently? Mr Brooks had indeed combed his hair, but that wasn't it. Suddenly Joe figured it out. I know, I know, he's smiling. (gasps) Oh yeah, AJ realised. Oh, it's really creepy, isn't it? What's going on, Mr Brooks? said Joe. Mr Brooks sighed impatiently. (sighs) Oh no, not you two. I warn you, any mischief and you'll be for the high jump. Is the Prime Minister coming, sir? AJ asked, looking into the big black limo that had just pulled up beside the police motorcycles. Yes, it was supposed to be a secret, you know, for security reasons, seeing as how he's pretty much hated by most people these days. But some buffoon must have told the papers. I mean, look at these cameras, he said, suddenly grinning and running a licked finger over one eyebrow. The doors of the black limo opened and out stepped a stout man in a mud-coloured suit. He had a red, wobbly face, in the middle of which sat a bulbous nose like a cherry on a particularly disgusting trifle. The man dabbed his sweaty face with a hanky and attempted to flatten his wispy hair with a clammy hand. The man in question was Percival T. Duckholm. He was the Prime Minister of Great Britain and it's fair to say one of the most disliked men in the land. He was the kind of man who would not only sell his grandmother for a quick buck, but he's also tried to sell your grandmother too. In fact, if you've got a moment, I suggest you give her a quick ring and tell her not to answer the door to any trifle-faced Prime Ministers. Oh, Percival T. Duckholm was also one of the rudest men you're ever likely to meet. He liked to shout at people. In fact, shouting was his most favourite thing to do in the world. He'd shout in the morning at breakfast to his poor wife and pale children. Then he'd have a bath and shout a bit in there. Then he'd get dressed and shout about how he couldn't find his socks. Then he'd go to work and shouty shout, shout until lunch before it all got too much and he had to have a nap until it was home time. You may well say, surely he can't be this bad. Surely someone must like him. I mean, he did manage to become prime minister after all. Well, the simple truth is the man he was up against was even more loathsome. I know, it's hard to believe. But let me tell you about Melvin Flewick, a man so obnoxious that if you ever got to meet him, it would take all your strength not to vomit through your nose just to be in the same room as him. He had greasy hair, terrible breath and dandruff so bad you think winter had come early by looking at the state of his shoulders. He picked his nose with all the eagerness and desperation of a man looking for loose change down the back of the sofa. When he spoke, it sounded like farts. He had the charm and manners of a drunk pig feeding at the trough. He hated pretty much anyone and any everything, and he made no secret of trying to hide it. So it's not hard to see why he chose a career in politics. So there you have it. That's the very short story of Percival T. Duckholm's rise to power. He just happened to find an opponent that was even more repulsive than him. So anyway, where were we? Oh, yes. He emerged from the car. He waved and smiled at the crowds, even though no one was cheering him. In fact, they were booing him. 
Joe looked round and saw that quite a mob had gathered. The more Percival smiled, the more they shouted and wailed at him. Resign, you lump! One angry lady yelled. You're a crook! Another man shouted. This just seemed to whip the reporters and cameramen into more of a frenzy. Percival T. Duckholm ignored the crowd and headed for Mr. Brooks. What a marvellous school you have here, he said. Thank you. Would you like to meet some of the children? Mr. Brooks replied eagerly. God, no, it's bad enough. I have to spend time with my own. Joe pulled the w- pushed his way into the front of the crowd. This was his chance. He figured that if he just explained about the park to the Prime Minister, he would fix it. I mean, that's what Prime Ministers do, isn't it? They fix things. Uh, Mr. Prime Minister, sir, can I ask you a question? Joe asked timidly. Ew! Get away from me, you horrible creature! The PM shrieked. I just wanted to ask you a question. It's about our park. You just wanted to fart a question about a park? The Prime Minister asked. Speak up, boy! No, I wanted to ask a question about the park. Our park has been closed down and they're going to build a shiny tower on it. By now, everyone was listening. Even Mr Brooks was staring at Joe, a mixture of bewilderment and anger on his face. Mostly anger, maybe 5% bewilderment. Joe wasn't used to people actually listening to him. He normally liked to sit quiet and let AJ take the lead, but he knew this could be the only chance to save his mum's job. Ah, the Prime Minister said, smiling. At last, a sensible question. Yes, it's true, we have closed down the grotty old park and built a shiny new tower. That's what this government is all about, building shiny new things. No need to thank me, Sonny Jim. The PM gave Joe a toothy grin, ruffled his hair and walked away. Oh, what an idiot, AJ said, looking at the Prime Minister. Hey, Joe, are you all right? But Joe wasn't all right. He was about a zillion miles from all right. His blood was hot and full of anger. How could someone so important be so useless? He felt like a fly that had just been swatted to the floor. The Prime Minister moved on, surrounded by reporters and cameras. They were like a pack of animals, feeding on every word that fell out of his greasy mouth. Charlie James, World News Today. Do you have anything to say for yourself? Anything at all about the allegations that you're a crook and a thief? No comment, Percival bellowed like a foghorn in a storm. Do we take it from your silence that the crimes they accuse you of are true, Prime Minister? Now listen here, you horrible little man. Are insults the best you can do, Prime Minister? Charlie asked, shoving the microphone right into the PM's face. Percival T. Duckholm, clearly having had enough of being pestered, stopped in his tracks and whipped round to face the reporter. I know in recent days there have been several accusations about me in the newspapers. Well, I would like to say once and for all I deny any wrongdoing. I can assure you the huge amount of money the police found in my bank account was simply resting there until I had time to find it to give it to the home for orphaned kittens. Furthermore, I can assure you that it was a genuine mix-up when I accidentally sold my grandmother to a travelling circus. I would also like to deny that it was me caught on camera giving those bags of cash to those dodgy businessmen. It was in fact my twin brother, the I only just discovered I had last week. Now go away. The sound of jeering and booing rose a level. The Prime Minister's pink sweat glazed face was getting more and more irate looking with every passing moment. What about the Deputy Prime Minister, Violetta Crump? Do you still stand by her? The news reporter asked. But before the Prime Minister had a chance to answer, another voice interrupted. Let me answer that. Out of the car stepped a woman dressed from head to toe in black, her painted nails in the sunlight like knives at the end of her hands. This was Violetta Crump, the Deputy Prime Minister. She was a chilling woman with brains as sharp as a pot of pencils dipped in lemon juice. She had a steely look on her face that made everyone feel puny and unimportant, and her eyes were sly like a snake's. The angry people were all now looking nervously at their feet, quivering. Do you still support the Prime Minister, Mr. Ms. Ms. Crump? Charlie James asked, his voice wobbling with fright. The Prime Minister and I go back a long way. He's like family to me and one I like, not one I'd sell to the circus. Percival laughed nervously. There have been many accusations about the Prime Minister in the last three days, but I don't know why anyone would think it was me who told the papers about the Prime Minister's crimes. I'm sorry, his alleged crimes. All of this talk that I'm after his job is just that talk. Why would I want Percy's job, his big house, his power? Oh, no, I'm just happy to work for such a special man. Violetta looked at Percival T. Dunholm as if he were a slug stuck on his shoe. 
Well, there you have it. Violetta thinks I'm brilliant. I think I'm brilliant. Now let's put this silly matter to rest. I'm in charge of you lot and there's not a single thing you can do about it. Oh, you shut up, you bumbling great warhog, came a small voice from the crowd. Mr Brooks looked around. Charlie James looked around. Violetta looked around. AJ looked around. And there stood Joe, his arms folded crossly, staring at Percival T. Duckholm. There was a deathly 